the following will be my disclosures for the next uh, two days. So in London, we receive institutional support from multiple companies and person and consultant receive royalties from Depew for IP transfer and involved in a few startups. So mechanical versus kinematic alignment. So this is going to be boring. And it, how I perform a total knee in 2019, it's not new, it's not sexy. I guess it's kind of like the person giving the talk. So it's conventional instruments, <laughs> no nav or patient specific, no robots. Um, I do conventional mechanical alignment goals. I never put in a knee on purpose kinematically, or I call it crooked alignment, and uh, measured resection. So that's the way I do a total knee. My debating partner is a friend and colleague. I mean, he's a very in intelligent, intellectual, and well respected. So it got me thinking, why? Why has he gone down this pathway? So I asked one of my ex fellows, who currently is in the same institution, sent me some of Dr. Victor's post op patient images from his clinic but from a decade ago, before he went into the whole kinematic alignment thing. And there's some of his post-op, you know, alignments <laughs> from his clinic. And, and now I understand, you know, if that's what you're doing, you better come up with a term for it. So historically, <laughs> historically, our standard of care has been mechanical alignment. And for most surgeons, they've achieved this uh, neutral mechanical axis in a pretty simple way. The distal femur's cut five or six degrees and the tibia's cut at zero, and that gets your alignment. And so with these alignment goals, how have we done globally? Well, in all honesty, we've done incredibly well for implant survivorship. So if you look at, and I agree some loose in that, but in general, you look at 500,000 total knees in the Australian registry, 16 different implant systems from all the different companies have a 10-year revision rate of less than 5%. So that's sort of our target. That's where we live right now for implant survivorship. So again, why are we even talking about doing it in a different way? Well, it's not because of survivorship, right? It's this whole thing on patient satisfaction. So we all know that registries have shown that somewhere between 15 and 20% of patients are either unsatisfied or uncertain. But I do want to emphasize the uncertain group is always actually bigger than the unsatisfied. That's well under 10%, and we keep glossing over that in terms of a point of fact. But that's then laid, led to a bunch of claims in 2019 for newer emerging ways to do it or technologies to try and improve patient satisfaction. So that's why we're talking about it. So historically, the standard of care is given as this. But Jan and Johan Bellemans published a very interesting article that really got the discussion going where they looked at their patients' underlying alignment. So what, what do they walk around with their whole lives? And one in three males and one in six females have an underlying varus alignment. And that's in their population. If you travel to Asia, for example, th that population has even more underlying varus alignment. So then the premise becomes, if you take somebody who's lived their whole life in a little bit of varus and you put them into a bit of valgus, Will that lead to patient dissatisfaction? That's the whole premise, I think, of doing it in a different way. So I would say my hypothesis is in order for kinematic alignment to be widely adopted and supported, I think three conditions need to be met. Number one, reproducible techniques have to be there to achieve this other type of alignment. You've got to hit your target for sure. Number two, we should have some degree of registry confirmation of long-term survivorship doing it this new way. And number three, the most important thing, we need to have demonstrated improvements in patient satisfaction, because if you don't have that, why do it in the first place? So point number one, alternative target. So you know, historically, when we do, you cut your tibia, you're aiming for zero. We've accepted that if you get within three to four degrees of that, you're going to have decent implant survivorship. I think we can debate it, but that's basically where we are, and lots of papers support that. The problem is, the challenge is, if you change that, can you still hit that target? So navigated knees, who here navigates their knees? Got one person. Everybody, so this, anyway, so navigating knees, I don't navigate knees, but it's been around for 20 years. And it's interesting is that there's such overwhelming data to suggest that suggested you're going to get much better overall standard deviation and tighter alignment if you navigate it. Now, there's been problems adopting it because of time issues and everything else, but you can get your target much tighter if you navigate your knees. And every single paper in any meta-analysis is going to favor that. So, so the point, we don't need to debate that. Interesting, some implant survivorship from Australia suggests that patients under 65 perhaps have a little lower revision rate if you navigate them, which probably makes sense because you're avoiding the outliers. So, number one, bless you, if you're going to look for an alternate alignment target, is it possible to be technically achieved? I say the answer to that is yes. However, that's going to require, in my opinion, some non-conventional instrumentation or some other way of doing it. If you're targeting, in other words, if you're going to target two or three degrees on the tibia varus, you can't miss and hit five or six. 
that's going to be a problem. So that we think we can agree to. Number two, registry confirmed long-term results. And you've already heard Richard talked about it, as uh, so did Robert, a little bit on registries. Registries are incredibly valid, really much like a randomized clinical trial. They're large observational prospective studies. Generalizability is a very important term for orthopedics that we should all understand. What does it mean? Basically, is if we know that the person that develops a new technique or develops a new implant, their results are uniformly better than when it's released to the entire population. And it kind of makes sense. So resurfacing, for example, in total hip, one of the originators released three, his data at three years had a 0.2% revision rate. The Australian registry at three years was 10 times higher. Okay, so that's generalizability, why we need to look at registry data. So do we have registry confirmed long-term results doing this kinematic? Well, the answer is at this point in time, we do not have this. We simply do not. Again, the target should be that 95% that we've got at survivorship of 10 years. I'm not saying we won't have it, but we don't have it right now. That's clear. Lastly, then, demonstrated improvement to patient satisfaction. So I'm going to put the knee in crooked because they're going to feel better, right? That's the premise of the whole argument. So the literature is mixed and confusing. So on the pro side, to say yes, putting it in that way is better, are a couple of good randomized trials. This one, kinematic versus mechanical alignment, 88 patients at two years. The kinematically aligned patients had higher Oxford knee scores, Womack scores, and mean flexion. Paper number one. Paper number two, they were all navigated, not randomized. 30 kinematic, 30 mechanical at one year. The kinematic patients had better knee society functional activity scores and mean flexion. So you go, there you go. That's why you want to put them in crooked. Well, the con side of that's very strong as well. So we've got, this is a randomized trial, kinematic versus mechanical, equal percentage, what 80%, they hit the target within three degrees. No difference in coos, quality of life, range of motion, two minute distance, timed up and go. No difference between the group. And in a, a award-winning paper a couple of years ago published 100 knees randomized to kinematic and mechanical, a two year follow-up, no difference in Oxford, Womack, and forgotten knee score. And the authors conclude we were unable to demonstrate any advantage to kinematic alignment in terms of pain or function that would justify the risks. So that's kind of where I think we, we stand. If you put in PubMed kinematic alignment knee patient satisfaction, you get nothing beyond those papers and a lot of papers talking about theories, but not the main driver to why we should potentially be doing it, and that's patient satisfaction. So we demonstrated improvement to patient satisfaction. Considering this is the biggest proposed argument for kinematic alignment, I think it's sorely lacking right now in evidence. So I'm left to conclude the following. We all want to improve patient satisfaction following total knee. Of course we do. Do a clinic, you want to improve patient satisfaction. Kinematic alignment has been proposed as a means of potentially achieving this. I would say in 2019, I see no compelling evidence to support a widespread adoption of this technique. Thank you.